The Peter Schiff Show. We got quite a bit of economic data that was released today, pretty much all of it confirming what everybody seems to be denying, and that is that the U.S. economy is, in fact, slowing down, uh, at least the way we like to measure it. We'll get more data later in the week. Of course, we get the big number, the non-farm payroll number on Friday. We always get that number the first Friday of every month. This Friday is June 1st, so we're going to get the May jobs number. We got the ADP number that came out this morning, which was weaker than expected. In fact, there was a significant downward revision to the prior month, which was originally reported at 204,000 jobs. That was revised down to 163,000 jobs, so about 40,000 fewer, about 20% reduction. Uh, This month, the consensus was 187. We got 178. Of course, that number will also be subject to a revision next month. Uh, But to me, uh, that shows that we're potentially going to get a weaker uh, number on Friday as well. You know, earlier this morning, we got some data on mortgage refis, which we get every week. Uh, We get the numbers on uh, new mortgages and mortgage refis. Everything is down, which makes sense because mortgage rates are going up. But in particular, the decline in refinances is to an 18-year low in mortgage refis. Now, one of the reasons that the inability to refinance your mortgage is going to become a problem is that refis have really been providing a lifeline to consumers to enable them to continue to spend. Because when you refinance your mortgage, you're generally doing it because you're able to reduce your monthly payments, because you're able to qualify for a lower payment. And of course, some people uh, maybe couldn't qualify a couple years ago because they didn't have enough home equity to uh, be able to uh, you know, afford the refi because the bank wouldn't accept it. But as real estate prices have risen, uh, that has enabled people who might have been unable to refi in the past uh, to refi now. And especially if the people who were doing a refi were also doing cash out. See, when you do a refi and you cash out some equity, you end up with more debt than when you start. Maybe you have a $200,000 mortgage and your rate is at 4.5% and you refi to a $225,000 mortgage with a rate of 3 and 5 eighths or something like that, you may be able to reduce your monthly payments even though you've increased the total size of the loan, but you're able to put cash in your pocket right away. So that extra cash is now spendable. You can go out and buy a car, you can you know, fix up your house, you can take a vacation, buy a new computer, whatever you want. And of course, if you're able to reduce your monthly payments, that's extra spending power that you can now use uh, for whatever your you know, daily or expenses are. So this has been fueling consumer spending. It's the additional debt and the ability to reduce the cost of servicing uh, your current debt. But if interest rates have now risen to the point where that option is no longer on the table, it's like the lifeline is gone. And now if you're a consumer and you're kind of tapped out, there is no relief. There is no way to get extra money by reducing your mortgage payment or by taking some cash out of your you know, ATM that we otherwise known as your house. And so if more and more homeowners are denied that lifeline, well, then that is going to be a problem for the bubble economy, right? Because you can't keep spending if you can no longer free up additional spendable income by reducing your mortgage rate or by uh, cashing out home equity. So this is going to be a bigger and bigger problem for the economy. And we're at an 18-year low now. I mean, pretty soon we're going to be at an all-time record low because pretty soon real rates are going to be so high relative to where everybody is that nobody is going to refinance. In fact, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to be stuck in their homes. They're not going to be able to trade up into another home because the mortgage is importable. You know, I remember a long time ago, a mortgage was assumable. Like if you had a mortgage on one house, you can buy another house and you can apply that mortgage to your new property. 
but nobody has an assumable mortgage now. So if you live in your starter home and you want to sell it and buy a bigger home, you got to go for a brand new mortgage. So maybe you've got this great mortgage, you've got a 30 year mortgage, you know, at three and a half. But now if you want to buy a new house, you might have to pay 5%, 6%, 7% for the mortgage. A lot of people aren't going to want to give up that mortgage. There's a lot of value in that mortgage, right? I mean, it's, it's like owning a bond where interest rates have gone down. I mean, if you own a mortgage where, or you owe a mortgage, but you only have to pay three and a half percent, but the, you know, the prevailing rate is 5% or 6% or 7%. That mortgage has a lot of value. I mean, the bank would love for you to sell your house and to be out from under that mortgage because it has positive value to the borrower. It has negative value to the bank, right? It's like you have bought a bond when interest rates were, you know, 3% and now they're 5%. That bond has lost value because if you sell it, you know, you've got to compete with current mark bonds that have higher interest payments. So, the banks would love it if you have a low rate and then you'd sell your house and now they're out from under that that problem. But a lot of homeowners are not going to want to give up such a low rate. And so they're going to be stuck in their house. They're not going to buy another house. Now, maybe you could rent it out and turn it into a rental if you can get rent that is above your, your, your mortgage payment and you can still keep it that way and maybe buy another house. But what's going to happen to more and more people is they're just going to be trapped, right? They're not going to be able to sell their house because they won't be able to afford the new mortgage if they buy another house. And of course, what also happens is that your mortgage is not only not transferable by you, but it's not assumable by the new buyer. And that's another thing that you used to be able to do. You can sell the house and the new buyer can take over your mortgage. But now the, the new buyer, if he wants to buy your house, he's got to pay the prevailing rate which means that the price that he's willing to pay for your house is going to be much lower. So not only are a lot of people not going to be able to move because they're not going to be able to afford the higher mortgage rates, if they sell, they might sell at a loss because their value of their property has gone down because the new buyer has to pay a much higher rate and that increases his cost to buy. And when people buy houses, they look at their monthly payments. And the you know the more they have to pay, in monthly payments, the less they can pay for the house. And so as interest rates rise, as mortgage rates rise, real estate prices fall. So the fact that so many people overpaid for houses, but also have very cheap financing is going to lead to a collapse in transactions because people are not going to be able to sell and other people won't be able to afford to buy. And this is not only negative for the housing market, for the home builders. I mean, look at their stocks. I mean, home building stocks have been under a lot of pressure, but this is just the beginning. A lot of these stocks are headed a lot lower. And of course, a lot of the banks, this is part of the problem that I talked about. Everybody was saying, oh, banks are going to benefit from rising interest rates. They're not. You know, Be careful what you wish for if you're a bank, because a lot rising interest rates are going to expose a lot of problems in the banking sector, and they are going to deliver a lot of losses uh, for lenders. And that's probably one of the reasons that banks are falling. Although one of the reasons they may have fallen so hard yesterday uh, were, again, the problems in Italy. But we did have a profit warning, I think, from Morgan Stanley. And that was one of the biggest decliners. I think the stock dropped by about 6% on, on the news. But the problems that Morgan Stanley are having uh, are, are ha being had by other banks. Of course, you know, the big decliner or one of the biggest decliners, I've been talking about that one, was Deutsche Bank. And Deutsche Bank uh, hit a new 52-week low. It didn't quite make a new low uh, since it collapsed because I think it missed the low by about 20 cents or so. It's down at 11.57. It was up today. Uh, I think it was down around 11.18 yesterday. And I think the record low from a couple years ago was slightly, uh, slightly uh, above that. So it didn't quite take out the 2016 low. But remember, uh, Deutsche Bank... That was a hundred dollar stock uh, before the 2008 financial crisis, and even when it collapsed in 08, I think it got down to about 20. So right now it's about half the price it was at the lows of 2008. And I mentioned before on a podcast that maybe Deutsche Bank is going to be the Lehman Brothers or the Bear Stearns of the next banking crisis, which could be a lot closer at hand than a lot of people think. We also got this morning the revision for Q1 GDP. 
And the last report we got was 2.3%, and they revised it slightly down to 2.2%. But, you know, it would have been lower than that had they not also reduced the GDP deflator. So according to the government, inflation was 1.9% uh, for the year. Uh, initially, they told us it was 2%. Look, I didn't believe the 2%, and I certainly don't believe the one9 uh, but even if you believe the 1.9, that means that GDP grew by 2.2. I think it's, you know, it's more likely that inflation was 2.9 than 1.9, in which case you can slash a full percentage point off the real GDP, because that would put it at 1.2, not 2.2. But the slowdown or the revision, I believe, had to do with inventories, uh, which did not build as much as they thought. And in fact, we got more inventory data out today for April, and April, uh, I think, was weaker than expected. They did revise down March, which is part of the, uh, the decline that we saw in the GDP. But wholesale inventories were particularly weak. Right? Wholesale inventories for uh, March were initially reported at up 0.5, and today they revised it to up 0.2, and that affected the GDP for the first quarter. But the consensus was for a build of uh, inventories of 0.3% for the month of April, but instead it was flat. But it was flat from just up 0.2. They expected it to be up 0.3 from up 0.5. So if you actually look at where we are in inventories compared to where the consensus estimate was, it's well below. So I think that should take out from uh, the estimates for Q2 GDP. We'll see, you know, the Atlanta Fed is still at 4% for Q2. They're going to, I think, come out with their next guesstimate tomorrow. Uh, so we'll see. My, my view is that they are going to be moving lower with their estimate. Now, the trade deficit numbers came out for uh, the month of April a little bit below the estimate. So that will help the, the GDP and that'll be a smaller subtraction. The consensus was for a $71 billion uh, deficit. And the actual deficit was $68.2 billion. But what's interesting about it is that both imports and exports declined uh, by a half a percent. So, you know, you're looking at a slowdown in both exports and imports, which generally would not be considered to be positive, right? You want to, you want to be, you want more economic activity, right? You want to show uh, that you're exporting more. And even the fact that imports are coming down. Why are imports coming down? Most likely because consumers uh, don't have the ability to spend as much money. Certainly, I just mentioned, they're not able to do the refis. And if mortgage refinancing was a source of additional consumer spending, to the extent that we're not doing as many refis, if we're at an 18-year low, then fewer homeowners can use that uh, to finance consumption. And since most of what Americans consume is imported, if consumption is going to slow down, then imports are going to slow down as well. Let me move from the economic data to the market uh, data or the market's reactions to what's been going on. I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, we had a lot of action in the stock market related to the political concerns that had developed in Italy that sent the Dow down over 400. I think we were down close to 500 points on our lows yesterday. We didn't close down that low. I think we're just under 400. And today we got the rally. In fact, the uh, smaller stocks, U.S. centric, Russell 2000, continues to make new record highs, as was the case today, up another one and a half percent. The Nasdaq had a strong day, not to a new record, up uh, about nine tenths of one percent. And the Dow Jones, uh, again, up one and a quarter percent, up over 300 points, you know, recovering a little more than three quarters of yesterday's loss. But I think there was bigger action in the foreign exchange markets. The dollar made new highs uh, for the move yesterday. In fact, the dollar index briefly peaked above 95. I think we got to 95.02. We closed today. I'm not sure if we're actually closed, but as I'm recording this podcast, I'm looking at 94 spot one five. So We've dropped from above a 95 handle to barely holding on to a 94 handle uh, today. And some of that was relief over the fact that maybe that political situation is diffusing a bit in Italy. But a potential nice move uh, in the dollar index, maybe we finally exhausted this bear market rally. I think all of the concerns about Italy 
may have brought this to a head, may have suckered in uh, the last speculative longs. Looking at the data, the, uh, the consensus is extremely bullish now on the U.S. dollar. It was quite bearish uh, a few months ago, and now all of a sudden everybody is bullish. Everybody is looking for the dollar to go up. It's probably almost as strong. The bullishness on the dollar and bearishness on the euro is probably almost as extreme as it was at the beginning of last year. And, of course, that ushered in the worst, the biggest decline in 14 years for the dollar. And so I think the fact that now we've got all the suckers buying into the dollar, uh, the dollar is now ready to go down. Uh, also, we're seeing a reversal today in the bond market. U.S. Treasury yields had fallen sharply based on the concerns about uh, Italy. And now that those concerns have lessened, we saw a sharp fall today in the bond market, rise in yields, though the yield on the 10-year still considerably below uh, 3%, 2.842. Oil price is also going for a wild ride. You know, yesterday, the price of oil got under $66 a barrel, and today we closed back above 68 so well over $2 off of yesterday's lows. The oil stocks were among the strongest, if not probably the strongest sector on the day. But the weakness in oil, again, I think that was a function of the spike up in the dollar and the concerns about a slowing a global economy uh, that may result from the political problems in Europe. But nobody really seems to be acknowledging the fact that the slowdown is not limited to that side of the pond, that the slowdown is in America. But the conventional wisdom and what has been driving this recent dollar rally has been the conception or the perception, rather, that while growth is slowing abroad, it's not slowing in the U.S., and that there's going to be this divergence of economic growth where we're going to keep on growing, the rest of the world is not, and that's going to drive a monetary policy. The U.S. is going to keep tightening. Uh, the rest of the world is going to drag its feet on reversing their easy money policies, and that is that perception uh, is what's driving this rally because people are perceiving that we're going to have stronger growth and therefore we're going to have higher rates. But everybody is missing the fact that growth is going to slow in the United States and it's going to slow rather dramatically as, you know, we are seeing now just by the data that's coming out. And of course, anecdotally, you can extrapolate on what is going to happen in the future to that data given the fact that interest rates have already risen significantly and they're likely to rise more. Although, by the way, one of the things that happened today with respect to anticipated rate hikes is the probability of three rate hikes uh, this year, three more. You know, the, the first of the three coming uh, this in June, right, in a couple of weeks. And the probability on a June rate hike is still about 90 percent, maybe 92 percent. But the odds of three rate hikes, which would mean one in June, one in September, and one in December, uh, those odds were about 40% a couple of days ago, and now they're down to 25%, which is a pretty significant drop, a 40% reduction in the probability of three rate hikes. Now, I think that the probability is actually a lot less than that, because if they do hike rates in June, I really don't think they're going to hike in September. I mean, I think September is going to be off the table because, you know, the election is in October, and they're not going to want a chance a hike, I don't think. Uh, especially if uh, the markets are selling off and the economy is slowing down. And of course, if that is happening, you know, what's the odds that they're actually going to hike in December? So June may be it. June may be the last one. And, you know, based on the fact that the market recovered, if the, if the markets had kept dumping on this Italian news, then that might have taken June off the table. Uh, but the fact that that hasn't happened, at least yet, might may give the, the Fed comfort to go in June, and that gives them a lot of breathing room between now and the next election. But you know, I really want to talk about the politics of of Italy because it's very similar uh, to what's going on uh, in the United States. I don't know how many people are making this observation, but I'm going to make it now. What has set off all the uh, concerns in Italy is the outcome of their most recent election and the popularity of these fringe parties. You know, let's call them the, the far right and the far left, uh, populist parties. And one of the things that these parties have in common is they are blaming uh, the ECB for their problems, a lot of it having to do with immigration. Uh, and uh, the idea is that, well, if they're in power, uh, that maybe there's going to be a Brexit type situation, that they're going to want to pull out 
of the Eurozone, although the difference is the UK was never a member of the Euro. I mean, they always had the British pound. They never adopted the Euro currency. And Italy, you know, they no longer have the Lira. Uh, they are now, they, they're part of the Euro. So Italy leaving the Eurozone is much different than the UK because now they have to, you know, resurrect the, the Lira. And of course, that would be the problem. But the, the fear that Italy may leave the Eurozone was not only pressuring the Euro down against the dollar. We got down around 115 area. But it was really pressuring uh, Italian government bonds. And, and if you look at the spread between what the German 10-year bond was paying and the Italian 10-year bond, it was as high as it's been, I think, since uh, with the EU. The Italian 10-year got up above 3%, whereas the German was 0.3. I mean, you basically was 10 times. You got 10 times as much uh, money if you loaned euros to Italy uh, than if you loaned euros to Germany. And of course, the reason is that if you loan your euros to Italy, there is a higher probability that you're not going to get your euros back. But what would really concern you if Italy left the eurozone is you would not get your euros back at all. You would get lira. You may have loaned the uh, Italian government um, euros, but they're going to pay you back in lira. Now, I never believed that Italy was going to be leaving the Eurozone. And in fact, a 3% yield on a 10-year, to me, doesn't reflect any real concern that Italy is going to you know, leave the Eurozone. Because if, if people really thought that, they would demand a much higher interest rate than 3%. Because who knows how much value uh, you're going to lose if you end up with the lira. Because the whole purpose of leaving the Eurozone and, and getting back to Lira is so that you can have inflation. I mean, you still have so many people that believe that inflation is a panacea, that the reason they have problems is because they can't print enough money, right? That they're being hamstrung, that their economy is being held back by tight monetary policy. And if they can only print more money and have larger deficits, that they would have a stronger economy, that they would have more uh, employment. But that destroys the value of your currency. And if you have loaned money to the Italian government, and you know you, you're expecting it to be paid back in in uh, in euros, and you get paid back in depreciated lira. I mean, no one's going to want those bonds. And in fact, if you're really concerned that Italy is going to leave the eurozone, you're going to want to yank your deposits out of Italian banks and put them into a German bank or some other bank. Because let's say you have euros in an Italian bank, and now Italy goes back to the lira. Well, they just might say, well, you don't have euros anymore. You now have lira at some exchange rate, and then it's going to collapse. So in order to avoid that, people who have euros on deposit in Italian banks, well, they're going to move those euros and deposit them in a German bank so they know that they're not going to get stuck with, with lira. So I think it was more noise because I really doubt that Italy would ever leave the eurozone. And of course, they'd have to put that to a referendum. And you know, while the British were w willing to Brexit because they never really adopted the euro, I don't think voters, I mean, a lot of voters remember the lira. I mean, the lira was a very, very weak currency. There was a lot of inflation. I mean, interest rates were sky high. I mean, the Italians today, the Italian 10-year now is back below the U.S. 10-year. I mean, the Italians could never borrow cheaper than the Americans when they had the lira. So the Italians have benefited from uh, being in the eurozone. I, I don't think, everybody thinks Germany benefits from it. I think Germany uh, would be better off without the euro. Uh, you know, people think, oh, it's great for them because they have this huge market to export into. Germany never had a problem exporting. They had huge trade surpluses when they had the Deutschmark. So they had a, a very vibrant, growing economy. They needed the euro like a hole in the head. But I think countries like Italy have actually benefited uh, from their inclusion in the euro. Uh, and to the extent that there's some fiscal discipline that's being exercised by Germany because they're in the euro uh, that is ultimately going to be a long-term benefit for the Italian economy. And I doubt if they put it to a vote that you'd get enough Italians who wanted the lira back and wanted to jettison the euro. But that created some panic in the markets, maybe some buying opportunity, maybe an end finally. Right? People rushed in to buy the dollar on these fears. But getting back to you know the politics of this and why, to me, it reminds me so much of the United States, is the populist parties on the left and right, the uh, left wing party, well, they're, you know, promising more welfare benefits. They want to lower the retirement age so workers can stop working 
and start collecting their retirement money earlier, right? Now that's, that's great. And they want universal basic income. They want to give everybody money, even if they don't have a job. So it's all about government handing out free money, right? That's why they're populist because it's all popular, right? It's all free stuff, right? Not having to work, getting money for not working. This is what the left wing is all about. Just giving away free money. How are they going to pay for this? They want to run bigger deficits, right? They just want to, you know, borrow the money, print the money. They can't print it, you know, not unless they leave the Eurozone because the ECB would have to print it and they're not likely to do that. But then you have the right wing party that wants tax cuts, but they don't advocate any spending cuts to make it possible. They just want to reduce taxes. So they also want to run larger deficits. So you have the populist parties on the right and left. Both want larger deficits. It's just they want to achieve them through different means. The left wants bigger deficits by government spending to go up, and the right wants bigger deficits by tax revenues going down. But if you put the two together, you get Donald Trump, right? That's basically what they have. And they want to make Italy great again by adopting the same policies that Trump has adopted over here. And Trump basically was a populist as well. He appealed to the same uh, emotions. Right. He said the status quo is no good. They're corrupt. They're inept. Well, that's basically uh, the script that uh, the Italians were, were, were running off of. Right. The, these fringe parties, the left wing party didn't even exist a few years ago. And they got I think they got almost a third of the vote went to this this crazy party. Um, but it's all about blaming the establishment for the problem. And, 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 and so we need, you know, a new solution. That was Donald Trump. Throw the bums out. I'm a businessman. I'm going to come in and drain the swamp. And did Trump promise any difficult choices? No. I'm not going to touch Social Security. I'm not going to touch Medicare. I'm going to spend more money on the military. I'm going to spend more money on our veterans. Right. I'm going to repeal Obamacare and replace it with something even better. Right. It was all about more government, bigger government. And by the way, I'm going to cut taxes. Free stuff for everybody. That was what made Trump so popular. He was different, right? And he was he was asking nobody to sacrifice anything. Everybody was going to get more, right? If you were getting a check from the government, you were going to get a bigger check. If you were writing checks to the government, you were going to write smaller checks. Well, that's basically what's going on now in Italy, except you don't have one person uh, who they can vote for. You have basically two different parties that if you push them together – you get the same agenda. I mean, it's kind of like Bernie Sanders, who, by the way, I read an article that he's planning on running for president. And if he wins, I think he will be the oldest person ever elected president. I think he's going to be 79 or 80 years old, which will make the VP a particularly important uh, position because, you know, the vice president is a heartbeat away from the presidency. And when the president's heart is 80 years old, you don't know how much longer it's going to be. Uh, and so, you know, that'll put the, the VP uh, in, in focus if he runs. And if he runs, this, this guy might win, especially considering how bad the economy is likely to be uh, by the time that election rolls around. But what you basically have in, in, in Italy is you have the equivalent of a Trump and a Sanders party both trying to form a government. That was the problem because these fringe parties were trying to get together and form a government. And the president of Italy was not allowing it to happen. You know, the Italian system, they have a president, they also have uh, a prime minister, and they, you know, they would have appointed a new prime minister, you know, through a coalition government of these fringe parties, but the uh, the president was blocking it because they were looking to put a finance minister in there that was very anti-Euro, wanted to leave the Eurozone, and the president, of course, did not want that, that did not match with, with his particular agenda, with his philosophy, so he was not going to allow, allow that to happen. And you know, then you get a lot of calls from the Italians that this is anti-democracy, that the president is thwarting the will of the voters who just voted, which is exactly what he's supposed to do. I mean, that is his job. His job is not to just do what the voters want. His job is to do what he thinks is right. I mean, that's why uh, he's not elected at the same time. He's not even elected. In fact, he's appointed by the legislatures. It's very similar to how the founding fathers established the United States Senate. Because, first of all, the senators were not elected by the people. They were appointed by state legislatures. That was changed by constitutional amendment as part of the, you know, the populist movement in the early 20th century. But the original uh, justification for the staggered term, right, senators 
uh, run for re-election one third every two years. So it's not like the House of Representatives where everybody runs every two years. You just have one third of the senators running every two years so that the Senate doesn't completely turn over uh, in any one election cycle. And the thinking of the founding fathers was that they were concerned that if some kind of popular sentiment kind of took hold in the colonies, they did not want it to capture the entirety of the Senate. They wanted to make sure that at most they would get a third of the Senate. And so you had the other two thirds to act as a break to try to slow down some type of, you know, wave of change that just might be a temporary thing. You know, all of a sudden something emotional happens and you get an election that goes a certain way and maybe the state legislature appoints certain types of senators. They want to make sure that you have an established group of senators to lean against that, to stand in the way in case uh, what uh, has been agitated for would actually be uh, a bad thing, a move in the wrong direction, which often is the case. I mean, generally when you have uh, some popular thinking that, that that all of a sudden comes out, uh, generally it's something that's not going to be a positive economically. So the founding fathers built that into our system, and that's the same thing that the Italians have. They have a president who can act as a break uh, on these elections, and if there is a big popular swing in one direction or another, he can lean against it, which is exactly what he's doing. And, of course, now he gets criticized for doing that. But one of the reasons, I think, or the reason that we had – a relief rally today is the idea that uh, there's going to be this new government with a finance minister who wants to leave the eurozone that has been uh, you know shut down. I think new elections are now going to be taking place. The president is not going to accept this government, and you know they're going to the Italians are going to go back to the polls. And I think for now the markets have calmed down, and they're hoping maybe for a better result in the next election. But the more important similarity is that you have the Italian electorate upset about many of the same things that are upsetting the United States. And the solution is not only throw the bums out, but let's run bigger deficits. Well, Italy is already broke. They're one of the most indebted nations in the world. I think debt to GDP, I think they're number two in the Eurozone after Greece. Yet they want to run bigger deficits. And of course, the Euro doesn't allow that. The most you're allowed to have in theory, because they obviously they've allowed nations to go above this, but you're supposed to keep your debt to GDP below 3%. And I remember when they first launched that, you know, the euro has been around not quite 20 years. They launched it in 1999. So it's almost going to be the 20 year anniversary of this, uh, what I believe will be a failed experiment. I just think that the dollar is going to fail before the euro. But one of the problems that I pointed this out at the beginning was by putting a cap of 3% debt to GDP, you pretty much assured that every government is going to run a debt. Nobody is going to have a surplus, right? Everybody is going to want to have a deficit because if you don't and your neighbor does, well, you end up subsidizing someone else's deficit. So if you put a limit of 3%, well, everybody's going to try to be at 3%, which means that the, the debts always increase. And most of these economies are not growing 3% a year. But if their debts are growing by 3% a year, then their debt to GDP ratios are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so the euro was actually a recipe for perpetual debt. Now, of course, if Italy was not part of the eurozone, they'd be running even bigger deficits. But what is happening is now Germany is being less fiscally responsible, too, than what would otherwise have been the case. And now what is supposed to happen, of course, is if a country is running larger debts, you know, there is a greater possibility that that country could default on those debts, right? That's supposed to rein it in because now all of a sudden, if your creditors think that you've got too much debt, they're not going to want to loan you any more money. And now you're going to be forced to cut spending uh, because you can't borrow anymore. But of course, the reality is the ECB is probably not going to let any of the member states default, and everybody knows that, and therein lies the moral hazard, right? Because if Italy gets into too much debt, they won't default. The ECB will just print money and buy Italian government bonds. I mean, there is a small likelihood, and that's why uh, the Italians are still borrowing at such low rates of interest. I mean, it's not quite as low as the rates that Germany can buy, but it's still extremely low, and that's because there is a high degree of confidence that the ECB is not going to let uh, the Italian government default. And that is part of the moral hazard of the euro, 
because now all these states are going to be able to continue to go into debt uh, because um, the ECB has got their back. But the irony of it is we have the same situation in the United States and nobody is worried about it. We have 50 different states that are borrowing money. And some of these states are basically broke. And when interest rates go up, they won't just be basically broke. They'll be practically or they'll be broke and they won't be able to service their debt. I mean, I can certainly see that now if rates really were to move up. Uh, a lot of these states would be insolvent, right? Uh, and certainly that's true with municipalities. And, and, and the government so far has shown an ability to allow a city uh, to default, right? There have been some municipal defaults that have happened, and they've been allowed to happen. But there has never been a state default. And that is certainly a possibility. But would the Federal Reserve sit by and allow the state of California to default on its general obligation bonds, or the state of Illinois, or the state of Connecticut, or any of the states that have a lot of debt, would they allow the default? See, I think that the Federal Reserve would no more allow a state to default than the ECB would allow a nation to default. And that is a moral hazard that is there that nobody is looking at. Because what would happen if the Federal Reserve bought the bonds of a state in order to keep interest rates artificially low for that state so that that state did not have to default on its debt or dramatically cut government spending in a way that would be politically unpopular uh, in that state. That would create the immediate moral hazard because now every other state would realize, hey, wait a minute, there's no reason for us to be concerned about the level of debt that we have because if we ever get into trouble, well, the Fed's going to start monetizing our bonds. But then you create the moral hazard where the fiscally responsible states feel like idiots. Hey, why are we balancing our budget? Why are we living within our means when all these other countries are able to live beyond their means without any consequence? In fact, we have to pay the consequence of their profligacy because everybody suffers the same inflation. Because if the Federal Reserve has to print money to bail out the, the states that are insolvent, that have been profligate, then the citizens who are living in the fiscally responsible states see the same depreciation of their currency as the residents of, of the profligate states. So that is the moral hazard that I think investors acknowledge exists in Europe, but they refuse to admit that the same thing exists in the United States. People talk about, oh, we have all these nations uh, that are sharing a single currency. They can't print their own money. Well, we have 50 states that are sharing the dollar, and none of these states can print money. And all these states have massive debt. And all of these states accumulated massive amounts of debt when interest rates were ridiculously low. And when interest rates rise, it is going to be impossible to service the debt, let alone repay them. And of course, also, a lot of these states, not only do they have bonded debt, they have unfunded pensions. A lot of state politicians promised government workers all sorts of money, right, uh, after they retired, but they didn't fund any of these promises. They just left it on future taxpayers, the same taxpayers that are on the hook for the bonds. But of course, the taxpayers are not on the hook for anything because they can leave. They can go to another state. And as they do that, the revenue implodes just as the debt service and pension obligations are exploding. And now what is the U.S. government going to do? Going to let a state default? And of course, if a state defaults and the muni bonds collapse, then people start worrying about other states defaulting. So they're damned that they do and they're damned that they don't. If the Federal Reserve allows one state to go bankrupt, then the markets start pricing in bankruptcy risk of all the other states. If, on the other hand, the Federal Reserve bails out the state that's in trouble, then more states get into trouble because everybody knows that there's, there's no consequence to debt. And so they all start running up more and they start making more promises that they can't keep. Uh, in order to get elected. That, that's what happened in Puerto Rico. And the same thing is going to happen throughout the United States. And looking at what's happening in Europe, instead of just thinking, aha, look at all the problems they have in Europe, when you're looking at Italy, you're looking in the mirror. Except the difference is the problems in America are much bigger than the problems in Italy because we're a much bigger country. The amount of money that we owe is much bigger. And Italy is a very small part of the global GDP. America is a big part. And a debt crisis in Italy is nothing compared to a debt crisis in the United States. 
because that's what's coming. And not just a debt crisis, but a, a currency crisis in the issuer of the world's reserve currency. In the meantime, you know, the price of gold barely budged during this, uh, this whole crisis. In fact, we're right at about $1,300 an ounce. Very little movement into the price of gold, but gold, you know, was pretty stable. Even as the dollar, uh, was, uh, was rising, the price of gold didn't really fall. Uh, it hung out not so with the cryptocurrencies. You know, they continued to erode away. Bitcoin almost got below 7,000. Didn't quite get there. It got below 7,100. Then there was a sharp rise in, uh, the Bitcoin price all the way back up to about 75, 7,600. Couldn't hold. As I'm recording now, we're trading between 7,300, 7,400. To me, the chart looks extremely weak. I am thinking that we're going to break through support, which is just below 7,000. My guess would be this next leg is going to take Bitcoin down to between four and 5,000. Obviously, it's going to drag uh, the rest of the crypto world down with it. In fact, I think a lot of these crypto stocks are a potential ominous harbinger of danger to come. Look at how they're falling. Remember Long Island Ice Tea, right? They're one of the first ones. They changed their name to Long Blockchain. Well, that stock hit a 52-week low today. It's back down at 33 cents. You know, that's about where it was before they changed the name. And then it went all the way up to 10 bucks just because they changed their name from Long Island Ice Tea to Long Blockchain. And people were buying that stock for 10 bucks a share. It's back down to a penny stock. It's 38 cents. But it's not just that particular stock. Look at this Riot blockchain, that company, that rose up to $46, uh, and now it's down to $697. Right? That's a huge collapse in the price of that one. Look at Hive. It didn't hit a new, new low today, but Hive, Canadian company, I think they mine mainly Ether. But that was at $675 Canadian. It's down to a buck nineteen. This Israeli company, Blockchain Mining, which used to be a, a resource company in Tel Aviv, and they reverse merged. Uh, Bitfarm, which is Canadian Bitcoin miner. And I think the stock was under a hundred a share, um, in Tel Aviv. And it, and it rose as high as 4,300 on the news. Well, now it's down to just over a thousand, down another 10% today. This is a 52 week low. It got down to 990. So that's a 75% drop from where it was a few months ago, but it's still 10 times what it was when they did the reverse merger. But the point is all these stocks are hitting 52 week lows. So a lot of the speculative Fire is is leaving the cryptocurrencies. In fact, if you go on Google Trends, you know, and just type in Bitcoin, so you can see the amount of searches, and it has collapsed. I mean, it spiked up at the end of last year when Bitcoin rose near twenty thousand. But if you look at it now, Bitcoin is as unpopular now uh, as it was before that huge rally. And, and so the fact that you don't have all this new money, remember the. The momentum in the cryptocurrencies depends on new buyers. New people have to come in and buy more cryptocurrencies. Well, if nobody is Googling Bitcoin, if nobody is now learning about it for the first time and then buying it, you're running out of chain, right? For your chain letter, right? You, you need more and more people to come in, right? That's the Ponzi dynamic. And if you look at the search engines collapsing, that's a sign that we're running out of chain, that there aren't new buyers coming in to take out the old money. Right to to enable the price to go up. So uh, I think we're going to start to see a bigger drop there. But gold, as I said, gold could be ready for a move. I know I've been looking at it, but with the 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 reduction in the probability of a rate hike in the U.S., which is happening, more weak economic data, which could change the narrative from the U.S. as the one economy that's still growing to uh oh, growth in the U.S. is in jeopardy too. It's not just the eurozone. But the U.S. that's slowing down. Then we start backing out some of those rate hikes. Maybe we start talking about the Fed pausing. <clears throat> Obviously, you know, eventually I think they're not just going to pause. They're going to reverse. They're going to cut rates. They're going to do QE4. That's going to be the beginning of the end. But before that happens, the markets are going to start pricing this in. And if the, the, the competition is gone, gold is going to be the last safe haven standing. It will be the ultimate store of value. And it's going to be where everybody on both sides of the pond. If you're in Europe and you're worried about the euro, you don't buy the dollar, you buy gold. If you're in America and you're worried about the dollar or any other currency, you buy gold. That is the one currency that everybody should buy, although not a currency, it's money. Right? If you're worried about money substitutes, if you're worried about the government's version of money, 
then you want to go to the free market version of money. You want to own the only monetary asset that is not simultaneously somebody else's liability, the only monetary asset that cannot be created out of thin air, right? where the supply is limited and where the value is real, where there's intrinsic, tangible value in properties that endure for thousands of years. And to me, more and more people are going to wake up uh, to the value of gold as they wake up to the reality of the lack of value in cryptocurrencies.